Um, today, Aaron, Ron, and I are going to talk about developer goals. Um, first of all, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to tell you about the other meetups coming up this month on the 14th. I believe Kathy Drew has a meetup um, in the evening, it's Thursday evening, and it is over in the Cobb County Government Building. Um, Mickey, what's the date of yours this month, Joanna? Two weeks from today, the 21st. The 21st? Right in the um, room. Are we going to be back in this room? Yep. Okay. Uh, Mickey has a meetup at 11.30. Um, what's your topic this month? Installing WordPress from scratch. Cool. Cool. Two I know people would need to come to that. Yeah, on the same meetup room, you'll see it in there. Yes. Um, slides for today are posted on my website, wpwhatnot.com. They're actually posted as uh, posts, so if you would like to make comments, feel free to do so. Um, what other housekeeping things? Anything? Okay, we'll just get started here. We're going to talk about tools. Um, working in WordPress, uh, being a computer programmer is a profession like any other. Uh, Bob, you can, you can work in WordPress in basically Notepad with just all you need is a keyboard and a, a little bit of knowledge. Um, there are a lot of tools out there, like there are any profession, that make it a lot easier and do things that you necess can't necessarily do on your own. So Aaron and I are going to show you some of the tools that we use today. Uh, I come from the perspective of being a single developer. I work by myself primarily, and I'm an exclusively a Windows person. Aaron does a lot of uh, collaborative uh, development, and he is primarily a Mac person. So you're getting you know, tools that work either for one or the other or for both. And two uh, fairly distinct uh, perspectives on why the tools are useful. So, oh, there we are. Oh, it's slightly different. Yeah. So. <laughs> Same hat. Same hat. <laughs> I've, got, I've got like three of these though, so I just happened, I knew that this was going to happen, so I brought this one. So. There you go. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is code editors and IDEs. Anybody know what an IDE is? Hardware. Just kidding. That's one. <laughs> one definition. Yeah. <laughs> What's an IDE here? Uh, to be honest, I don't know what the acronym is. So, and I probably should get in the video. Um, <coughs> at the screen. So, I think you're right. I use an IDE. Um, actually, I just don't know what, no. Um, so, there, there's, um, there's IDEs and there's text editors. And basically, an IDE is it has text editing capabilities, but it has bells and whistles, right? So, it allows us to. If you're a more of a hardcore developer, using an IDE sometimes is um, beneficial. Um, if you're doing plugin development, or really if you're doing any, if you're developing a theme, probably using something like PHP Storm is important, which we'll get to in a second. Um, these these first editors, I hope you don't mind me jumping in. <laughs> just, I, I think I think this is what yeah. So so we kind of went through who's going to talk about about what. But I I have used all of these editors. Um, in these first four, um, Adam brackets, Notepad and Sublime are to me. I shouldn't use the word identical, but they're similar enough where you give me a computer and I've got one of those and I can write code. Um, Adam is runs on Windows, Mac, and possibly Linux. Uh, brackets is the same way. Adam is done by the guys at GitHub, um, and it is really extendable in the aspect of it's built on HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, so if you are smart enough and feel like you know modifying the editor yourself, you can. Um, 
but it's it's open source and by the guys at GitHub Brackets is uh, very similar. Oh, by the way, Adam loads much faster than, actually I don't know about Notepad because Notepad is specific to Windows, but it loads a lot faster than these others. So I use Adam. If I'm just going in and fixing one thing on a site, um, editing, you know, something real simple. Um, but so Brackets is by the guys, um, small company that does Photoshop, um, Adobe. So they, I don't honestly have no idea why they have their, um, an editor that's open source, um, cause they don't, as far as I know, they don't have a product, um, where they make money off of it. But it's a good editor. Notepad++, um, I used four or five years ago um, on a Windows machine, and it's similar enough. Sublime Text, I don't use it. I know a ton of people use it, um, and I don't use it because it's not open source. Um, uh, it's a, it's kind of a nagware, something like every 10 or 20 saves, it says, please register. And I think it's relatively cheap, but I don't, you know, if you can get it free, you might as well. Uh, VI has been around um, probably since the early 70s. Um, in 90s, they created uh, VI Improved and it became Vim. And if you want to be the fastest editor in the world, start using Vim. Um, it's what I use when I'm on a Linux or Unix machine. And it's copying and pasting and duplicating code and navigating is once you understand what you spend about eight hours learning vi it'll save you um, a ton of time um, and then there's php storm 90 bucks or 100 bucks a year for a personal license and like i said if you're doing plug-in development if you're trying to debug specifically um, you know you need to get what a variable contains at a certain instant in your plug-in development you know halfway through the page being built, you know, you can get all the variables you need. So it's an incredible tool that all the big wigs use. So yeah, all the any, serious developers. Yeah, all the serious developers. <laughs> so um, you guys have any questions about editors? Anybody use anything else besides these? What about Text Wrangler? What now? Text Wrangler. Text Wrangler, I don't know. That's a Mac yeah. thing? Yeah. I'm not familiar with it. Is that is that a uh, is it open source or is it? Uh, it's open source. Yeah. Oh really? Okay. So I I know the icon. One of the nice things about that one is you can edit um, from the FTP site. Okay. Um, rather than having to download it, edit it, and upload it back. Does that integrate with um, another uh, FTP client? It has its own. It has its own. Built in, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, I use it. I actually use it with Fetch. Okay. Yeah. I do possibly similar things. So for FTP, I use um, on the Mac um, Forklift, um, which is a great FTP tool, which I don't think we covered any FTP we tools. Um, but uh, Forklift is really good because it integrates one FTP, SFTP, S3, uh, Web, Dav, Dav, whatever it is. Um, Anyway, but with um, with Forklift, you can kind of do the same thing. Edit it, it opens it, and when you hit save, you see it in the background. Forklift will save the file. So, but. Yeah, Notepad++ has a, an FTP server built in, but I don't use it. I use FileZilla. I think Adobe has another called Code. Code what? I think it's just called Code. Okay. You can't come to the Okay. So they don't have a, do you know if they have a standalone? Like you can get it without the cloud? I don't know. I'm okay. sure that every time I try to open a file, it opens that program. Gotcha. Okay. Well, then Aaron, one, we use the code anywhere, which again, is a little bit different animal than those. It kind of combines FTP and IDE in one. Do you want to talk about that real quick? How it sure. works? It's an online code editor, which has its own set of concerns. You have to load all your credentials and stuff onto their server. I kind of played with it a few years ago, and then they raised, I don't know, some absurd amount of funding. And they're, they're a bit more legit now. Now they have dual-factor authentication stuff. But really, you load their website every time. You can open the web, your sites inside of it and edit files and stuff and save them to the server there. 
Not good for larger teams, because again, you want Git or something with better revision controls and stuff. And it does have some of that built in, but it's nice. As I jump around from computer to computer, I have this laptop, I have a Chromebook, I have a desktop at home, desktop at work. I log on that site, all, all my stuff's there, I get to work in any line. It works pretty well. Yeah. I'm sure that comes in handy, and someone calls you, and you're out in the middle of nowhere, but you have a computer, you can go in and fix the site. Right, so. or even uh, they have good apps for it, so I can hop on my phone. <clears throat> And really, it works pretty well considering, you know, every now and then right. we get HD access power comes, you can do that from the phone. Certainly not, not some people must do Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I frown slightly upon some of that. I understand the, the tools, but when, when it probably works really well on relatively smaller sites, but if you're doing real high-end plug-in development stuff, you know, that's going to be... Um, right. It's more about the size of the team, I think, than the size of the site. If you have a bunch yeah. of people working, you want something with better, yeah, right. better revision control. Not size of the site, but we have some pretty big sites we've handled with it, but yeah. Size of the team can be an issue. And again, for me, if you don't have access to the internet, you're toast. A lot of people like to work offline, a lot of you can work offline and push your stuff up, they, up later. Right. So if I'm offline, it's useless. That's why I always have a hotspot and, you know, yeah, that's another certainly a, a downside to it. You can't, can't work offline. Right. So I'm sorry, it was called Edge Code and it's not Rackets. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay, there you go. <laughs> then we covered it. <laughs> Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about validation, uh, testing your site for various things. Uh, with the local, with the uh, recent uh, change in Google, everybody should be aware of Google's mobile friendly tool. This is how you can tell whether Google uh, considers your site to be mobile friendly, it's quite important. And if it, if it doesn't, then it will tell you why not. Um, webmaster tools. Um, I have them. I don't use them a whole lot, but Mickey gave me the, the rundown earlier. It's, it's essentially Google looking at your site um, like it doesn't know all the things that you told it in Google Analytics. It, tell, it evaluates your site for uh, various things and issues and problems and if it finds a problem, it will email you. That's that's a big plus. Um, Mark that validation for the cover. Uh, yeah, go ahead, do that one. So, how many of you guys uh, do markup validation? <laughs> <laughs> Mickey's raising his hand like yeah. this. <laughs> I look at it. You look at it and you, you, you ignore it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I was going to say, um, markup validation is, to someone like me, extremely important um, because I have no idea if SEO, um, if Google uh, ranks you differently on bad code or good code or not. Um, my uh, website, which is sideways8.com, does not validate. And I'm going to show you why. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard that before. Yeah. Gravity forms. Gravity forms. And you keep going. It's gravity forms. Um, everything validates except for uh, gravity forms. And to um, it's honestly really hard to, if you're using plugins, you cannot guarantee that the people that are writing the plugins are going to do valid markup. Um, but you don't want to throw um, major errors like a missing div or not closing tags and stuff like that. And that's one of the things that you, you need to be doing. Um, recently, well, a year or two ago, I went to all these big agencies in Atlanta to their websites and no one validated. And most of them had, I mean, some of them had hundreds of errors. Um, so someone's not, some people don't care about their code, um, so, but that's something that's good to do. Because I can look here too. It'll remind you if you forget your alt tags for images and that sort of thing too. Right. Which I never. <laughs> Which is a big I'm, thing for me. It's a big thing for SEO people, so I, <laughs> as the picture shows up, I'm happy. <laughs> 
So, um, so theme testing is important um, if you're writing themes. Uh, I don't think anybody, how many of you guys um, write themes to release to be in like WordPress.org or um, Theme Forest? Nobody needs to use this tool. Um, <laughs> if, if you buy something like something on Themeforce, you can get that and see if it has all the tools. What it does is it checks to see if you have a, a fave icon or if it has the comments.php file or a page.php. It checks to make sure that everything has all the, the um, what should be there for a valid theme. So, According to WordPress. According, yeah, according to WordPress. And I, I'm not sure if it's developed by Automatic. Um, I know that yeah. the guy do that. Okay, they recommend it. Um, so, browser debugging. Okay, and we've been through this. I think in in um, well, in a bunch of the meetups, we've talked about um, using using Firebug or using Inspect Element. Um, anybody here not familiar with how to do that? Is everybody here awake? Does everybody use it? Yes. 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 Okay. So we, we don't really need, need to, to go into that. Um, I use it primarily for debugging CSS um, and by figuring out where I didn't close the div and that sort of thing. Um, okay. Checking on sites availability. Uh, is it down right now? Is a really good tool because every once in a while you go to the site and it comes up not found and you don't know why and you can't tell if it's your local machine or your router or your whatever. Go to is, is it down right now? It'll tell you if it can reach the site. So that'll tell you it's a universal problem or it's something <coughs> local. Uh, I use Uptime Robot to monitor some of my sites for clients. Uh, it basically pings the site every five minutes. And the free section does. You can, you can get, there's a paid version, but the free version We'll ping a site every five minutes and let you know if it's not available, which can be really handy because it'll let me know before the client calls. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, Next one. Um, this is the awesomest tool. I just so, I didn't know this. Yeah. So this before. this tool. How many of you guys uh, migrate a site when you develop a new site and you go to another um, server? How many of you guys use a tool like this? Okay. It is, it's amazing. So what it does is, um, let's say I've developed a site and I'm putting it onto WP Engine or GoDaddy or, uh, no, WP Engine. Um, and, and it's currently on GoDaddy. We, you have to make a DNS change. You have to tell all the computers or servers in the world that, hey, it's now on this server. And what this does is it lets you know, um, it goes to all these different uh, DNSs throughout the world and let you know, all right, where is greenmelon.com currently? I have no idea where it is right now, but you'll see it when, when you're doing the DNS change, you'll see, oh look, it's starting to propagate. Um, and so what I can do, the client will say, I'm not seeing the new site. You know, I can go there and look and say, well, it looks like you know it's 50% done or whatever. So it, it comes in real handy. Any questions about that tool? Next one is uh, Pingdom. Pingdom. Pingdom is very similar to, I think, uh, Uptime Robot. Mm -hmm. There's there's two different tools, actually. Mind if I? Go. The, uh, the first one, Pingdom.com, is a paid service that what um, my company does is we, we pay uh, something, I don't know, 10 bucks a month, and we hit, we put some of the important clients, you know, on there, and so, like, what she said, if the site goes down, we get an email, we get a Slack notification, um, you know, that something is wrong, so we can start debugging before the client calls, which we have one client that is, I don't know what he does, but he is constantly on the site, um, and he'll let us know um, when it's down, but he won't move to where I recommend, so. Um, but like, this is really cool. Um, this is a free tool, um, and I'm sure Google has a tool like this um, that does kind of like page page weight, mm -hmm. lets you know, um, you know. Man, that's horrible. Let's see, testing for Amsterdam. Do I? Well, it says earlier it was testing for Amsterdam. 
Well, that could be why. Well, nonetheless, this this will go through and tell you, um, you know, what's taking so long to load. Um, gives you a performance grade. Yep, that one always gets you. Anyway, caching and everything is good. If you're not getting, you know, if you're not using any kind of caching uh, plugin or your hosting doesn't provide it, you probably should. There's a tool, W3 Total Cache is a good caching uh, tool. It's kind of a pain to set up. What are some other um, caching? Like there's a Super Cache. Does anybody use that? No. Does anybody use caching? Super Cache comes with does it? Yeah. Most of the managed WordPress is, uh, have uh, caching nope. built into them. Okay. No one raised their hand though. No one uses caching. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm like, I'm like, man, that's a talk in itself. Um, um, yeah, things like uh, WP Engine and SiteGround, um, they they have caching built in, and I think. Honestly, I think GoDaddy has started doing some with their WP um, platform. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think. It I does think that's right. Some caching. Yeah, the GoDaddy built it in. Um, by okay. the way, there, there's a script on WP whatnot for removing those strings. Yeah, I'm not sure where that's coming from. So. Something that's some plugins that are throwing version numbers after. Ah. Uh, okay. All right. Five lines of code in my yeah. email. <laughs> yeah, there's a so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, testing. No, I okay. thing with uptime robots. You know, I used to, used to use it for a while. It's great. It's free. Mm -hmm. The problem is, as soon as it sees your site down, it lets you know. And if, if people are on less than great code, but time you go get it, it's back up. And so we were getting, we had like a hundred sites there. I was getting my things all day long, and I just tuned them out. But it's not what you want either. Right. Even right. Them, you can set it to say check every five minutes, but wait till it's down three times in a row and then let me know. Um, but it was right. really expensive for that many sites. I use one called Short Monitor or Dash Monitor.com. Okay. It's not free, but for like 39 bucks a month, you get like 50 sites or something. Yeah, Kingdom is not cheap, and that's Kingdom why we, we do the, the cheapest tier, and we, we we have about three servers that we use, in, um, and we just have one site hosted on each one that that monitors. Because I figure if if one's down, they're all down, um, you know, on that specific server because it's probably MySQL or something uh, breaking. So, um, so can you talk a little bit more about Kingdom? Um, so you put a, your website in, and it gives you a grade, and then you, you go to the page analysis. And Yes, um, how do you un, let's try this, can you, um, yay, it's a Windows machine, so I'm, <laughs> what did you do, I don't know how to do that, you, tab, um, tabs that were closed, uh, on the Mac, command shift T, uh, so command, command T opens a new one, the shift makes it open ones that were closed, um, You're and so, about Windows, that's rich. so, well, it, the control, <laughs> control shift T, because I didn't know I in Firefox if it would do okay. it, but, um, okay, so, where were we? So, what, what was your question uh, specifically? Okay, I'm sorry. So you, what do you do with the grade once you get it? How do you use that information? So, I mean, it, it really all depends. I mean, so, for example, um, if you have... Uh, leverage, uh, if you're not doing any browser caching, you need to make sure that you don't have code in head that tells it not to cache on the browser, because if the browser isn't caching, every time you go to it, it's going to download everything. Um, and that's, I mean, that's kind of true for everyone, but each one of these are going to be uh, slightly different solutions. So there's best practices for each one of those things that yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. And, and what we'll do a lot of times is we'll get a site um, ready to go and make the DNS change and whatnot. And then we'll make sure that this thing is not horrible. Um, so. And in the page analysis, is there, is there guidance there? This shows. What I would do is take those phrases where it tells you, yeah. and I would Google it. Okay, you know. 
Yeah. If you don't know what leverage browser caching means, Google it and you'll find out. That's the killer. Anyway. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, am I covering this? Um, so how many of you guys, yeah. do you want me to cover? Sure, why not? All right. Um, how many of you guys use um, dummy content uh, when you're developing? OK, half. Um, so the whole point of this is when you're building a theme, um, what this uh, XML? Yeah, so this is the XML feed that you'll, you would download. And you know when you go to WordPress, you, um, you import the data, and it creates all the pages and posts and calls in images and all kinds of stuff. So what you can do is make sure that all of the content, you're, you're styling every element that needs to be there. So if you have ULs and LIs that aren't indented, you know, it, it'll generate that stuff for you. It's just a time saver. Um, and I didn't used to do that until recently. Um, I think the clients have been pushing for more content uh, styling, like being able to uh, organize the content differently. You know, I used to just have like real basic styling in there, and now I'm having to make sure that I'm doing it all right. <laughs> so, and then this one is actually pretty good because. Um, because you can, uh, it's an XML file that you can import and then you can clean it out when you're done testing. Delete and all the pages and posts that it, right. it creates. Right. So. And the users. Um, the, the biggest reason to do this is, is because if you don't, you're going to test it with your client's data and then in three months they're going to come along and put in different data that has bigger pictures or different kind of lists or something and it's going to go wonky in there back to them because you didn't style for that. Yeah, like for example, uh, a couple months ago we used the exact size images we needed and so the site looked really good, handed it over to the client and of course they're not going to resize images, they're just going to upload and then I realized, oh wait, we're not, so, so the page you know, was this big and the image was this big. Um, overlapping everything, so um, I just had to add some CSS to it. But if I had used what I should have done, you know, I would have been good. So, backups. Okay. Cover the first two. Yeah, my my backup uh, preference is Backup Buddy. Uh, anybody use Backup Buddy? Who uses Backup Buddy? Um, not because it backs up better than anybody else, but because the migrating and cloning functions are super, super easy. Um, there are a couple of environments that I've found to manage WordPress environments where I can't run backup body and it makes me crazy. Um, but it's, you set the schedules, it runs, you've got your backups wherever you want them to be, integrates with all most of the, well, with all of the off-site services that I've wanted to use. Um, S3 and Dropbox and yeah. Google Drive. All of those. And it'll also email it to you if you want or send it to an FTP location. Um, but where, where its value is, is when I want to clone a site or migrate a site and I take the backup and import Buddy and put it on the new site and within five minutes I've got a perfect clone of the site. So, one of the features that I like best about Backup Buddy is you can restore one file. Yes. So that when you have just screwed it up, <laughs> or when a plugin has updated and now yeah. breaks, you can restore just that plugin. Yeah. To its earlier version. <coughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Back WP up was what I used before. Uh, I invested in Backup Buddy, and it works just fine. It's just a little more manual on the restore. Mm -hmm. uh, the backups are fine, and they let you put them where you want. Can you still back up just one file? Can you restore one? Or, yeah, restore one file. No. Manually. Okay. Manually. Uh, it doesn't have the one-click features that Backup Buddy does. 
Uh, but you, I mean, you've got all your files, so you can go into the zip and you can pull out that one file and manually FTP it up. But it's just not quite as user friendly. That's free. It is free. That's that's a point in favor. That's when I was going for all the free stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah, Duplicator, now that we've discussed uh, Backup Buddy, I feel like Duplicator is inferior. So, um, I, I use Duplicator all the time. If I get a client uh, saying, hey, my site's broken or I need this feature, um, and we don't have it in a repository or I just have never worked on the site, first thing I do is I go and install Duplicator, um, and I just it creates a zip or targz or something, a uh, zip file. Um, that contains a MySQL dump also, and I take that and set it up <clears throat> locally, um, which takes me maybe five minutes if the site downloads quickly. Um, but it, it gives you a full copy, and I'm, I'm sure Backup Buddy would do the same same thing. It's just one tool that I I use. I also like the fact that it's iThemes, which means it's got really good support, and I know it's going to be around for a while. I know it allows you to restore just one file from the dashboard too, or, or do you have to manually do it? Um, or, you know, I've never tried that. You can do it from the dashboard. And you can oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Oh, no. And you, when can you, you, you can revert a plugin back from the, dash, yeah. from the dashboard as well? Yes, you, you can back. restore by, at file level, you're right, from the dashboard. Okay. Yeah. Um, my new favorite, CodeGuard. Um, I got introduced to them at WordCamp, and um, I have an account there now. Oh, oh. Okay, I can't get over there. I can't get over there. <laughs> okay. Uh, CodeGuard is a service. Um, it's based on Git, which means you have version control. Um, it does a lot of the same things that Backup Buddy does. Um, I don't know. I, re I, I don't have more than like a month's experience with it, but I absolutely love it. it. Sends me an email every day telling me what all the files that changed on the site in the last day so I can monitor to see if anything changed that I didn't change or I wasn't expecting. Um, I have five sites on here and uh, I set the, I set the uh, interval to daily for all of them, as well as their databases. Um, it has restore options that are, um, let's see. I can't see my whole screen here. Really buggy interface. No, I'm just kidding. It, it was fine at the coffee shop we were just at. No, it's the screen resolution. It's cutting off the left part of my screen here. Um, let's see. Okay, this is my this is my status on this one site. Um, I can go into any of my any of my previous uh, downloads and it will, or backups and it will tell me all the files that were changed. Um, and it gives me restore options to do the entire site, uh, to download the zip file and do whatever manually, or to selectively restore by file or by folder, whatever. I just love this service. And they're locally based and they have some really cool technology. Okay, um, you're gonna talk about manage and infinite? Sure. So, code, yeah, like she said, CodeGuard is uh, Atlanta-based, so we were actually in their office last week um, mm -hmm. for a meetup, so that was kind of cool to see someone, you know, making money off of WordPress, kind of cool. Um, but CodeGuard and ManageWP are very similar. Uh, I think CodeGuard is, do you know how much the price is for per site? It, uh, $5 a month for one. Yeah, for $5 one, $39 a month for up to 12 Thank you. Okay, so every, you know, if you want daily backups and, um, I mean, they, they have some really good features. Manage WP is 
slightly cheaper um, by like a buck or two a month. The thing is, is that looking at the sites, um, you can't call them um, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, Code Guard, if you go to the second tier of support, um, you can call them and they'll, they'll help you out, which to me, you know, if you have a client that's paying you, you know, for support, monthly support or something, that's, you know, worth it. Um, how many of you guys use Infinite WP? Okay. I used um, Infinite WP. Um, I think it's pretty good. Um, the thing I like about it is, one, it's free. Um, and then secondly, it's kind of a, they have modules. So if you want the backup module, it's... 50, 60 bucks or something for the backup module, and you can integrate with things like S3 or Dropbox or FTP and stuff like that. Yes? How far back does Code Guard go? Say if I had a file I messed up last week and I bought it today, would they able to go back that far? They go back as far you? as you uh, have been storing uh, backups. There's no, there's no limit that I'm aware of. It if it was six months that. ago. Because they're because the way they're do you know how Git works? Do you know how Git works? Okay, they don't store the whole backup. Well, all they store is the original file, and then they store a file that lists the changes. So it's not like they have you know you're building up a tremendous amount of storage. So as far as I know, you can go back as far as they have backups of your site. And I don't know with uh, managed WP how far back that goes, but it's it's very similar. Um, if you want to show them Infinite, I have it on the tab that I found. So, I don't use Infinite WP for backups. I use it for mon basically monitoring my sites. So uh, part of my is, routine in the morning is to see which of my client sites need updating for whatever. Yeah, we we still have some sites about 50 that are still using Infinite WP. We're actually moving to either CodeGuard um, or Managed WP, I'm not 100% sure. But we have someone that goes in and they log in, look at the sites, figure out, oh look, WordPress is one version behind and the plugins, and you can sit there, do a drop down, and select what you want to upgrade, not upgrade, et cetera, et cetera. If you wanna just, hey, you don't have any uh, themes normally, you have like, I have 2012, 2013, and, and all of them. This morning. Yeah, so, um, but it, it makes it real easy to update because you want to do all of them at once and you got 50 sites. It's check, hit submit, and it does a cron job and just loops through and updates them. So, somewhat scary sometimes, but um, but it's for, for what it is, I mean, it's, it's free. So if you don't want to pay monthly, um, that's a, it's a great uh, solution. The only thing that I don't like about it is that you do have to set it up yourself. Um, so it's a little more, you know, if you don't know how to FTP in and set up a MySQL database and configure it, um, it'll be, you know, you have to spend a little time doing that. Well, I can, you don't have to do that. You just have to, I don't, well, maybe you do. Yeah, you have to install yeah, on your own servers. Well, I know it's installed on my servers. Did I actually have to set up the database? Well, maybe. It was a while ago. You know, for the client side, there's just a plugin that you install. Right. Yeah, right. You only have to do all the setup once. Once, yeah. 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 I guess it was a long time ago. I helped, I helped someone at uh, WordCamp uh, this year. Um, they said, can you help me with this tool? And I was <coughs> slightly nervous. I'm like, I don't know. And she showed me what it is. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's easy. I mean, it took me 30 minutes to set it up. Um, so, but it's, it's a good tool. If you can migrate it easily from one server to another. I've done I it. It's that. a manual process. It's just, just a manual okay. process. Do you have to reinstall it? What what I what I did is I um, open forklift site one site two drag the folder over. Um, what's really annoying? It's smart and it um, you have to reinitiate with every site because it's like, hey, this is on a totally different um, server now. So you have to you have to modify one PHP file, um, you know, change it from old domain to new domain, um, or it's gonna do an infinite loop. Um, and then you have to reinitiate, which means go to the other sites, 
yeah. deactivate, reactivate. I mean, it's time consuming. I mean, they, it's slightly obnoxious, but. They, they told me I could just um, export the IWP sites over. Maybe you can do that. I don't know. Well, let us know, oh, let us know if it works. <laughs> yeah, let, let me know. Yeah, yeah. So, I recall it was a pain in the butt when I had to do it. Yeah. Excuse me, Karen? Yeah. You say you're not going to use anything at WP anymore and kind of move away from that, but like Copart doesn't do the update the plugins, update the themes, anything like that. What, what do you I don't do? know. Does it? No, it doesn't do any updates. It's just purely backup. Yeah. Managed okay. WP does. Okay. You can tell it, you can, you know, update all the sites and everything from, from Managed WP. Okay. So. Now, I don't do a lot of updates directly from Infinite WP. I do some. If it's background stuff, if it's like a plugin, like Ultimate Coming Soon page that's not critical to the site, I just hit the update button. Yeah. If it's a 2012 theme update, I just hit the button. But if it's a if it's another plugin that's maybe more critical to the site, I just use that as my monitor to tell me it needs to be updated, and then I go directly to the oh, site right. to do it because. I want to double check that the backup was made, and then I just want to take a look at the site and after it updates. Any problems using okay, updating the plugins automatically? No. no. I used. Um, we had 90 sites in um, Infinite WP, and things were getting outdated quickly. We had over 800 <laughs> updates that we needed to do, <laughs> and I just made sure everything was backing up on the S3, and then I just let it let it roll um, and. This was a couple months ago. Um, it did not have any, no clients called. Um, <laughs> so, so that was a good day. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it this was. This last two weeks has been crazy with update yeah. after update. Yeah. After. Between the plugins and WP, it's been just constant. And this has been a lifesaver to keep up with it all. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you want to cover more okay. or less? We'll talk about more or less. Who uses less? Who knows what less is? CSS Compulsor. Yeah, well, yes, it is. Um, who would like to use less? <laughs> Nobody, okay. I don't even know what it is. Okay, well, um, you know what CSS is. And less and or SAS, SAS, SAS and less are like cousins, sisters maybe. Um, they're very similar. What they allow you to do is uh, use variables and use constants in CSS. So that, for example, if I have a site that uh, uses specific colors, and they all do, I can, I can go in at the top of my less file, and I can say, every time I say purple, it's that color. Unless you like to memorize hex codes. Yes, so. which is always fun, and it I've is. done that before too. So down here, every time I want that, per and I can say, I can say things like, uh, this is actually one of my favorites. Um, I can say light purple, and I can do I can do that, and now I have the same color without having to go to Photoshop or wherever and figure out what it is, I just have light purple. Really good for hover, hover yes. effects and stuff yes. like that. Or dark purple or whatever I want. And so down in here, I just have purple all over the place. And when the client calls and says, oh, you know what, we don't like that purple. Can we make it a little more magenta? I just say sure. And all I have to do is change this one thing. It propagates into my CSS and the whole site is changed. That's the killer app for me. I'm convinced. I'm sorry? I'm convinced. <laughs> it, it also is yeah. really, um, can I type real quick? Yeah, sure. yeah. Cool. I want, let, me, let me show you one more okay. thing. This is the other reason I love it. Okay. This is how I write CSS, because my brain processes things this way. I like to have uh, my selector and my parameters all in one line, because I don't like scrolling forever. But this is not the proper way to write CSS. This is just for me. When I have this little 
little program, this little compiler, that every time I change that less file, this compiler updates a file called style.css in the same folder. And style.css comes out looking like that. All beautiful. Can that so, minimize also? Uh, yes, it can. It okay. can minify as well. Yes. Okay. And I'll just, can I show one more? Oh. Or, so I use I use SAS, but SAS and less are it, it would take you about 15 minutes to convert mentally how to do it. I'm going to do this. This is why I use. We will make sure we don't save this file. Um, <laughs> this matter. is this is why I like um, less. Um, so I do <laughs> header, right? And I do width 100% and height. Uh, 1M. Now we have a H3 div okay. in here that is float left, and then we have a um, H3 uh, font size and 1M. Ah, all right. So my editor would. I know. Do this. <laughs> um, so when you're not going in here and creating header, and then this, and then header div this, and then header div h3. So you're not having to duplicate things. It saves you so much time. Um, it takes a little while in trying to remember that, crap, I've got this one more tool that I need to run to make it compile, because if, if you don't compile it, you're not going to see your change. But once you have that set up, it's, it saves, saves a ton of time. And I've also had a situation where I was <clears throat> working on a project and I had FTP access and I didn't want to set up the whole environment, so I used an online CSS compiler. So I was able to write, you know, 30 lines of CS or SAS that's generated 60 lines of CSS. So kind of, it's just it's all about time to me because that's how I make money. So. Well, that's right. And then being able to use variables and being able to type it so it's readable to me are just invaluable. How did you get that? How did you use that or add it? Do you have a um, uh, download, you can download less from here, lesscss.org. Uh, the compiler that I'm using, and it runs in the background, you set it up to watch folders. So if it finds a less file, it will automatically generate a, a a CSS file in the same folder. You can tell it what to name them. But this this little program, this winless, runs in the background, so I don't have to think about compiling. It just does it every time I save my less files. Um, SAS. It's, SAS is basically the. Does it have a the, automatic compiler? Yeah. So th there's probably 50 compilers. Um, I use this thing called Grunt. Uh, which is a command line tool that integrates with PHP Storm. So what I do is I find my grunt file um, in the theme, right click on it, tell it to watch, and it watches the directory. I have probably with the project 20 to 30 uh, SAS files, um, and it generates some, you know, and it's, and it's quick. So if you make a change and hit save, within a second or two, it's recompiled. So it doesn't it doesn't slow you down once you start using that tool. So okay, <coughs> moving on to storage. Where to put those backups? Where to put those photos? Where to put the stuff that? Yeah. You guys ever use CodeKit? It, it, it's like a tool that like refreshes your browser as you make code changes. On the fly. Uh, I've seen it. I've never used it. Same here. It, it does it across like all your devices. Like it'll do your cell phone, your tablet. You use like a local host URL. Mm -hmm. 
say that it's a code. It, code, code, kit. Kit. code kit. Yeah. yeah. So does like, it work with Google Home? So you don't have to like you don't have to like uh, re um, reload your browser every single time. It just does it automatically every time that you as soon as you save your file folder, it's done. Nope, I know you. Okay. Well, that's a good. Chris Chris Coyer talked about it. If you guys have tools that aren't included in here, uh, please make comments on the website and add them there so that the other people who might be interested, including me, would have access to them <laughs> later on. Thanks. Um, okay, the three three major sources that I use for storage, for cloud storage, if you will. Um, by the way, I saw the other day uh, a definition for in the cloud. You know what it means? On someone else's computer. <laughs> Essential. Okay, so Dropbox, everybody knows Dropbox, right? You get a certain amount of storage for free and then it's relatively cheap after that. Yeah, it's 10, cost me 10 bucks and I get a terabyte of space. So. Just a terabyte. <laughs> Just a terabyte. Gosh, that was the that was the universe so little time ago. Uh, Amazon S3. Anybody use S3? Oh, bunch of brave souls. Uh, not for the faint, not for the faint of heart. Amazon does not make user friendly products when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, you know, Dropbox actually uses S3. To do um, it. So, a lot of people use so, S3. But so it they seems that yeah, they they made a nice wrapper around <laughs> yeah. something that's really complex. Mm -hmm. so. um, Google Drive. Everybody's got a Google account. I think everyone in the world has a Google account, which means you have access to Google Drive at some level. Um, I like Google Drive because you can easily share things with it. And you can put your documents or whatever in there and share them easily. Dropbox is not bad for sharing either, um, but it does require a little bit more work on the part of the person you're sharing with. Amazon 3, forget it if you want to share stuff. <laughs> Unless it's another techie person who has an S3 account, forget it. Not worth your time. Um, okay, fonts. A big thing. Um, there are any number of ways to use fonts in a website. You can embed them, you can link to them, um, you can enqueue them. It's, there are easily a dozen ways that you can embed fonts or use fonts in your website. Uh, these are some good sources for fonts. Uh, you want to show them about Font Awesome? Sure. How many of you guys use Font Awesome? How many of you guys use images for icons when you're building a theme? A few? Okay. Um, so Font Awesome is... What's the problem with using images for icons? They scale. They don't scale. Yeah. They don't scale. Yep. And you can't change colors very easily either. So Font Awesome gives you a slew of icons. Okay, I mean, we use this for um, anytime we're building a plugin, you know, that if it's, if it's like a people icon, you know, like adding staff members or something, there's an icon in here for like, it looks like three people. Um, mostly we use it for... Um, Directional icons? Nope. Uh, so social yeah. media um, icons. Mm -hmm. So it scales, so, and it's extremely easy to use. Um, the first time I saw it, I thought, oh crap, that's one more thing I have to figure out. Um, but, now I hope that my social media icons are <laughs> somewhere on the site. Um, it, it's actually a font, so you can size it, color it, okay. uh, CSS it, just like you do any other font. So inspect element, and the cool thing too is that it's something like 128K or something. So that's bigger than if you're only going to have three images or something. Um, 
you know, your images are probably going to be just 20K or something like that for social media icons. But if you're going to be using it throughout the site for different things, like as you can, um, let me go back up here. Um, somewhere. So these are font awesome icons, you know, so comes in uh, handy. Um, but it's real easy. You do a, um, is that readable to you guys? Okay. Um, I mean, you just apply the class of font awesome and then the name of it, and then you close it and it shows up. So and then you enqueue it. Um, you know, you can enqueue it correctly or you can just plop it in your header. Um, but anyway, it's real simple, but it gives you a, just a nice uh, set. So you don't have to, every time you're designing a site or something, have to go in and create or find you know, a good looking Pinterest icon. So. Diane. Yes. I'm trying to leave a comment on getting like human capture error on the site. On the... Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'll check that out. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> you want to take the uh, other three? Font Squirrel. Yes. Um, font Squirrel is a very cool resource. How many of you use it? I've used it in the past. Okay. A few. Um, it's a very cool resource. Uh, lots of Lots of cool fonts. I'm typing. Uh, lots of cool fonts. Uh, searchable, uh, a little more search friendly than Google Fonts. Uh, lots and lots of fonts. And I've probably used two dozen of them over time, and they're pretty high quality. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, this about Font Squirrel is your web font generator. If you want to embed fonts and you need them in a file type that you don't have, like you download a TTF file and you need something else, this will allow you to upload that file and it'll convert for you into the different formats uh, if you prefer to embed your files. Uh, I'm not sure what else to say about it. It's just a really good resource. Um, everybody's familiar with Google Fonts, right? Um, there's plugins around that. You can uh, embed them. You can link to them. Uh, on and on and on. Uh, not the most user-friendly search, or not the. You can't really slice and dice it as well as I would like. But and some of the fonts are so-so you know, on the quality side. But there are some good fonts out there. Uh, what the font is a really cool tool. It, let's say you go to a website and you see somebody's logo and it's not in font, it's not in text, it's actually a picture. You can do a screen capture of that, upload the picture. You want to optimize it first, make sure it says really good quality um, uh, contrast. Upload the picture and it will try to guess what the font is. And even if it doesn't get the exact font, it will give you some alternatives to kind of show you where to look for a similar font. It's a really cool tool uh, for those clients who say, I want that. The mobile version is where the gold is there. You just plug your phone, take a picture, and then it tells you on a bus stop or a billboard. Or I've never tried that. It's beyond awesome. It's That's cool. Awesome. Very cool. One more tool um, okay. that I forgot about. I found out about this. Um, recently. Um, uh, Skyfont. Uh, does anybody use Skyfont? Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, don't fall. Uh, makes me nervous. Um, yeah. So what this does, um, if you put it down, or, okay. yeah, cool. Um, Pretty awesome. I like it. It's like the it's sky. So, clean and so anyway, I'll explain it. Um, what it does, it it kind of has a wrapper, and I don't know if they have it for Windows. They have it for Mac, but you can. Hey, look. Um, it allows you to. So, so Google is always like they have Ubuntu font and 
with Lato and all that stuff, and it's always being updated. And when you're a designer, if you have a Photoshop file and you use those certain fonts, you won't download them, put them on your computer. And what Skyfont does is it will go and say, uh, if, you, if you install it through Skyfont, it'll go and check and say, hey Google, is there an updated version of this font? Um, and it allows you to talk to lots of different, hey look, bottom right. Um, so you can basically install all those fonts as opposed to use, using the tool versus going to the site, downloading the TTF, and importing them. So just a nice little tool that I don't use often, but I think designers would, I think designers probably would use designers it more. Designers would probably want it. So. I think um, what the font has a Chrome plugin too that will let you click on things on other websites and tell you what font it is. I think you're right. I think you're right. Real quick, is there a, a, a better option between, like I used to at import for Google Fonts mm -hmm. versus putting the link in the header file? Is one better than the other? You know, the Depends on who you talk to. Pardon me? Depends on who you talk to. Oh, okay. um, hardcore people will tell you to enqueue everything, mm -hmm. so you should enqueue that as a <laughs> as a script in the oh. functions file. Okay. Um, it, it's it's it works CSS. Either way. I mean, the the font is CSS basically. That's how the browser reads it. It should be enqueued in uh, functions.php. Okay. So I think I have. I'll make a. I'll find my post about it and I'll link to it. Um, I think I have it's. I mean, it's five lines of code to enqueue it. Um, and I see a lot of people will take um, Google Fonts and they'll they'll have the CSS and then they'll do um, Lato and then Ubuntu and it's all these different lines, which every time it's talking to Google, it slows down the connection. You can do Lato, Ubuntu, you know, all the fonts at once. Um, and I see that done incorrect. Ah. It's not necessarily incorrect, it's just an inefficient. inefficient way. So, okay. yeah. so but yeah, I'll, I'll find It's definitely that. not recommended to just put a, the link that Google gives you in your header. Right. That's the least of what I used to do. do. That's what we all used to do. That's what Google told us to do. Yeah. I mean, who were we to question them, right? Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about design and resources. Um, if you haven't seen this and you're a color person and you want um, some inspiration for your designs, uh, you put in a base color and you've got all kinds of options in terms of choices to go with it, complementary, supplementary, whatever. Um, I use this when I when the client says, well, I like gold, and then I can go, okay, well, what's going to go with that? So this gives you some ideas. Um, a lot of Disney <coughs> Exploited Futures, that's the site that I use. Uh -huh. You can actually download um, yes. an Illustrator color palette, mm -hmm. and um, I, it's on Alpine, maybe, so you can click it. I don't know. I've never tried that. Mm -hmm. I know you can save it. Maybe it is an XML file. Um, everybody knows what fave icons are, right? Okay, they used to be a real pain in the butt to generate. Now you, uh, there are several online generators. This is the one that I use most. Um, you upload a, an image file and it creates the fave icon for you. Um, is that .cc or .cr? It's .cc. Um, it's, a, it's a real clean one. If you don't like it, you adjust your image and upload it again. You get it right. Uh, Colorzilla, a great and helpful tool for um, figuring out what color you're looking at on a given site. Um, it has a bunch of other features. It's, it's uh, for Chrome and Firefox. It's a color picker, color analyzer. Um, I'm trying to think what else it does. It holds all your recent ones and that's your colors. Yeah. Does it? So that when you're, if you're doing anything in your browser, 
Belgium who could go up and check on the black cards, get tax codes, or like are you? I never knew that. <laughs> That's a good tip. <laughs> that would be really handy rather than having to go back and select it again. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have one, and I'll have to con I'll have to go back and look. But we use one that's a Chrome plugin that will give you the hex codes for all the colors on the site, and then it'll highlight on the page where they are. Ooh, that would be awesome. I'll, I'll have to make it's a note. Color is it Colorzilla? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't. Is it so right, page color That's what happens when you download stuff and you just don't read the instruction manual. You don't know all the stuff it'll do, right? <laughs> um, okay, page ruler and measure it. Both are very handy tools if you're on a site and you want to know how big that is. It'll, you just draw it out. Uh, I don't have that installed on this browser. Um, very handy for deconstructing things and figuring out how big images need to be especially if you've got variable sizes. Um, it'll tell you in inches or pixels uh, how big things are. Uh, oh, one of my favorites, awesome screenshot. Everybody use that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's you take a screenshot of the entire page instead of just what you can see on your little laptop. Okay. Any questions about those? <coughs> okay, now we're on to photos. I don't know if you've noticed all the cool photos in my slides today. Um, really cool photos, all of them free, all of them from unsplash.com, which is one of my favorite sites uh, of all time. All the, all the photographs there are high resolution and absolutely free to use for any purpose. Uh, I think they upload 10 a day or something like that. Um, but there's everything. You can get them here on YouTube. I've never done that. But yeah, I like to go and look. I mean, just from all over the place, just beautiful high res pictures um, of just about anything. Um, Dreams Time which is a site much like iStock Photo, uh, has a number of free images and they change on a regular basis. Uh, they're also very inexpensive. If you want to buy images from them and they have a huge, huge selection. They're my favorites. Uh, Pixabay is much like Unsplash. I don't use it very often. Um, this is a site that I just found recently, Gratisography. Um, the pictures are a little edgier if you're tired of the same old stock photos. Um, some of them actually go beyond what I find to be in good taste. But, you know, if you're looking for something real interesting or different, um, same terms, it's all free. Yes? Would you know where to get, like, um stock medical photos or like diagrams like dentists like uh, on the I don't. Models. I don't. Okay. Uh, I would probably search at Dreams Time if it was me. Uh, they have a they have a tremendous selection of photographs. And if you don't need really large versions, mm -hmm. they range somewhere from a dollar to five dollars a piece, usually. Okay. So Okay, we're gonna talk about screen sharing. Cool. You wanna go for this one? Yeah, I'm gonna roll back one second. Okay. Uh, for something. I'm trying to wrap this up uh, real quick so we have a minute to. Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, actually, pretty much need to go. Yeah, we do. Um, I just made a comment. Oh, there it is. Hey. How to enqueue Google Fonts uh, correctly. So, um, obviously, you want to prefix, like Aaron Matthew Ryman. I mean, prefix it with something that no one else would be using. Like, uh, having a function called Google Fonts would be really bad. But, um, so prefix it with something like that. But that's the code you need to do it correctly. And then, 
to, um, you know, if you need to add more, do a pipe, uh, lato, pipe, whatever. Um, so, um, all right, screen. Okay, I'm not going to get into the development stuff because that's prob probably could be its own little talk. Um, so, oh, sorry, screen. Yeah, um, oh, <clears throat> screen yeah. sharing. Um, how many of you guys use Screen Hero? Okay, it's um, my my team uses it all the time because it allows you to. I have my mouse on the screen. Whoever's connected to me. I see their mouse. Um, you can have, we've had, I think, up to four people on there. And when we're all trying to debug something, you know, I've spent 30 minutes on something. I call a guy on my team and say, hey, look at my computer. And he takes full control over it. Um, and multiple people can uh, do it at once. And it's free, um, which is kind of nice. Uh, Join me is really good um, because it doesn't require. Mickey, you got a question? Oh, I thought I, thought I saw your hand. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, Join me is a really good tool uh, because it doesn't require any kind of installation. Um, so you, the client, if you need them to see something, you say go to joinme.com and type in this nine-digit code, and then they can see your screen, or you can do vice versa. It's good for tech tards. For what? <laughs> for people who are just not technically inclined. Right. It's right. really good for that. There's no download. They don't have to do anything. I use it for training a lot. Then the last thing, um, Slack and HitChat. Uh, HitChat is something my team used to use, and um, uh, Slack became available, and it's free. And it's a what would you even call it? It's an instant messenger that an instant is instant messaging service. Yeah, that's that's free, but it's I have my team, so I have the Sideways Eight team, and then I'm connected to the WordPress. I have nine Slack uh, channels, ch channels yeah. basically. Or actually, well, groups. Groups, yeah, because yeah. channels go within yeah. the groups. But um, so I can, um, I have clients that use it. Um, we have a really big project that is starting, and instead of getting emails, bombarded with emails and stuff, it comes in real handy. But also, they have the WordPress um, team, you know, thousands of people in Slack. So if you guys need, you know, some support, um, Ask a question through Slack. Um, it comes. It's it's a great tool. So if you're if you're one person, it might not do you any good. But if you're working with a team, it's handy. I know. I think Mickey. I was telling him to use HitChat, and then he started using Slack, and then I'm like, oh, Slack is better. Um, so so I started using Slack. So and same with Teamworks. We switched over to Teamworks from Basecamp. Yep. So. Um, I'll tell you what you meant. Too. What? I'll tell you the next thing. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So. Um, He's out there on the bleeding edge finding all the new stuff for us. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to wrap up? Um, yeah. The, the, la the last part is we're just not going to get into it. We yeah, don't we've, we've got some more stuff and it's on the website if you want to look into it. Um, this is a whole talk in itself, uh, which we're just not going to go. Um, <coughs> some other resources. Um, who's hosting this? what WP theme is that, and then the obvious ones that sometimes people tend to forget. The Codex, Google is your second best friend, and then there are any number of extensions and add-ons for Chrome and Firefox, Firefox sorry, that can make your life easier. Um, questions, comments, Nothing? Now that you've switched up to using Git, mm. are you glad you're making that transition? Um, I'm still learning, but yes. I, see, I definitely see the, the advantages and the potential, even as a single developer. Um, I'm, I'm learning from these guys who do all kinds of collaborative stuff how I can apply a lot of what they do to what I do to make, to give myself backups, essentially. Mm -hmm. Would it be just the version you use? Yes, it's, it's version control. Is that really all what it's about, the version control? Yeah. Um, 
As far as I'm concerned, that's exactly what it's about. That's all it's really about. It, it comes in, it's, I have a friend that works at Cartoon Network and he manages their render farms, 100 computers, and he writes Python all day long. And he does, um, he's the only one writing code, um, but he uses Git and he's been using it forever. Um, and it doesn't seem like with just one person it would be worth it, but being able to roll back or branch the code so you can start screwing around with one you know, snippet of code and then be like, ah, that might not work out. You can jump back over and continue working on the code that the client is expecting, and et cetera, et cetera, and then you can jump back to that later. Um, and you just don't, you don't lose code, basically. I mean, that's right. that's one of the most important parts. Is but a development, a development uh, We'll make that a talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Section, yeah. you skip, I'd like just a talk about that. Yeah. Okay. And that's really more you than me because I'm kind of a newbie with that. Um, the scenarios where I find it invaluable are I've been working in the file all day and uh, I hit save and I close it and I realize, oh gosh, I need something that I just erased. I need some functionality that is now gone. It's not in, I can't do my control Z back to, to get it back. It's gone because that was the file. Um, now, and there's only, the only way I can get it back is if there's a version of that saved somewhere else. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. I'll show them, um, you can take your laptop. Right, go with this. Okay. I'll just show you real quick on, so I use, um, I use Bitbucket uh, for my repositories um, versus uh, GitHub. GitHub is really good, but it's, um, it's really better for open source and free projects, uh, free, um, projects that you're going to share with, right. you know, people throughout the world. Versus me and my company, we're going to just uh, the client will never need access. It's basically for us, and I don't want everybody to see the code that we have. So, oh, it did a. Is that Slack? Snap! This is really obnoxious. <laughs> um, all right, let's do this. So, Bitbucket. Looks like you have a meeting in nine minutes. You better hurry. Yeah, so, um, goodness gracious, I'm trying to think of a... Uh, um, fencing. Real work. So this is a Bitbucket host my code. Um, I have, I sync up with it. So when I make changes in the theme or the whole environment, I post it up there and we can access it. You've got, here's the source. So we can look at um, the footer content file in here. And you can actually make changes in here and do a commit. But basically, um, this is a commit from two days ago. We can um, look at what the full commit was. We can go back. I'm trying to find a branches commit. So I can see Garrett's been <laughs> working on stuff. But we can go back for, I think we've been working on this project for years. We can go back and look and see what Garrett did or David did or I did. Um, and if I need the client comes back and says, hey, you know all that stuff you just wrote, we don't like it, uh, roll back so I can go back to this specific, um, to this commit, and this is what was changed. I can see it, and I can, somewhere in here, there's a uh, roll back. I, I do it all through my computer. I don't use the web interface, so I'm not super familiar with it, but you can, you can easily roll back and restore snippets of code or certain files or whatnot, but it comes in real handy when you have more than one person um, writing code. So, but that we can wrap this up. So okay. I can talk about that for a long time. <laughs> it's, it's fun. I, I was I hated it um, 
about three or four years ago, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Every time I make a change, I have to go in and say, this changes this file and adds this, you know, but what, when, you know, you come back to a project a year later and they need something done, you know, you can look back and see the history of what was built and kind of why it was all built, so. Um, can I talk about one thing that I haven't told? So, so we are, we meaning uh, my company and a company called Dragon Army, um, we are building, starting a project that'll happen this fall, and it's called 48 and 48. Um, we're going to build 48 websites in 48 hours with uh, 48 nonprofits. And what we're looking for are people that can build themes. Um, and in an hour? Uh, in, in, two <laughs> in two days. So we're going to need, we're gonna need 96 developers. Um, so we're going to need basically a you know a team you know two people that hopefully have worked together before so they know how to you know how they work um, and we're just uh, we'll have the site up at the end of this month but I just want to put you know ears or news I guess out there so people can start thinking about that I think it's going to be a really fun project we've actually got IBM and Red Bull backing us up already um, which is going to be pretty handy, but if anybody is interested in that, let me know. We're looking for where are you gonna, coders. Where are you going to announce it and accept applications? We're, when we have the site up, uh, you'll just be able to submit. Um, really don't know yet. I'm just looking for the, the geeks right now, but we're going to need 48 designers. So you can do, so. Is it, is this going to be a virtual event? No, it's going to be downtown Atlanta at um, I forget where it's going to be. This fall? It'll be this fall, probably October. So. Oh. And it'll be around the clock. Yep. It's going to be intense. So, <laughs> I've, when my business partner told me about it, I said, "There's no way we can do this." So, and then I've thought about it, and I'm like, "Well, yeah, we probably can make that happen." So, um, as long as we have enough coders. And and these are for nonprofits and and using all the tools that. About We're going to be using uh, underscores as the base theme because it's standard. Um, we're not using, we've debated using Genesis, um, but Genesis is something you have to pay for. We want to use something that is open source. Um, so we'll be starting with that. We're going to have five framework or layouts that designers can try to stick with um, and meet with the client at the beginning of the project, designers design, you know, for the first day, and then coders come in the next day. And, and is this going to be jury? Is it what? A jury, judge? Um, yes. Some, someone will win. So I don't know what they, win, uh, what they wind up winning, but okay. anyway, just putting that out there. I'll be promoting it soon, so. Okay. Uh, well, we're right at 9 o'clock, so I guess that's it. Thank you, Val, for Thank coming. You.